Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Peart, and welcome back to the Salty Science Podcast. So just as a quick recap, in the last two episodes, in episode one, we discussed the different salts in seawater and what they're made up of and where they come from. And in episode two, we discussed salinity, which is the term that we use in science to describe the concentration of salt in water or the ocean saltiness. And if you're a new listener and this is the very first episode you're listening to, I highly recommend that you go back and listen to the first two episodes as they provide super important foundational information for future episodes. And as a quick reminder to all of my listeners, Salty Science episodes are designed to build on top of each other, so I also highly recommend that you listen to the episodes in order. It'll just be more fun for you in the future if you do so. But honestly, I try to give enough of a recap and define all my terms that you could, in theory, jump around from episode to episode, depending on whatever topic you want to listen to. And finally, before we begin, I just want to give a quick shout out and a big thank you to everyone who has already submitted their listener challenge answers. They're really great, and thank you so much for emailing me. And as a reminder, once a quarter, I'll be having a special episode where I just read out your answers to the different challenge questions. And I'll do something like pick the top answers for each episode. And so you still have time to submit your answers. The first listener's episode will air Friday, November 1st. So you have roughly until Wednesday, October 30th to get your answers to me. And FYI, you are allowed to submit more than one answer. Just saying. And hmm. And while I'm thinking about it, I might just find a super fun guest to read some of the answers with me. Oh my goodness, this is going to be great. I just can't wait. Okay, so now with all of that said, let's move on to this week's episode. So originally this episode was going to be on the ocean temperatures, but because we're building our knowledge base to get to density, Just like I decided to take a step back and talk about the salts in the ocean before we started talking about salinity, before we start talking about the ocean's temperatures, we need to take a small step back and start out by talking about the sun, or rather solar radiation. But what's great about this is that this episode actually serves as a foundational episode for many, 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 many future episodes. From the color of the ocean, to photosynthesis, to light attenuation, to net ecosystem metabolism, and so many other topics. You'll really want to pay attention to this episode. And as an aside, believe it or not, I actually had to study about the sun to become a marine scientist. And I remember sitting in my very first marine biology class and oceanography class at Stockton University, super excited to start studying the ocean and all the cool organisms found beneath its surface. But instead of learning about the ocean or dolphins or sharks or fish or other really cool things found in the ocean, we started out by studying the solar system, specifically the sun and the moon. And I honestly was like, oh my goodness, am I in the wrong class? here and I seriously thought I was in the wrong class for like the first two to three weeks. But then as we did transition to actually studying the ocean, it all started to make sense why as marine scientists and oceanographers we need to know more than just the ocean. And here's a quick disclaimer, I am a marine scientist, not an astronomer or astrophysicist, so I'll be discussing the sun relevant to what's important to marine science. Okay, so let's start out by asking, what is the sun? You may recall from one one of your science classes, or even if you do a quick Google search, that the sun is a huge glowing sphere of hot gas. And it's about 70% hydrogen and about 28% helium. And it's also made up of small amounts of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and then even some smaller amounts of so many other elements such as neon, ion, silicon, magnesium, and sulfur. And just as a fun fact, while the sun is pretty small compared to other stars in our galaxy and even the universe, it's not the smallest either. And in terms of size, the sun's diameter is approximately 1.4 million kilometers, which is 870,000 miles. But to put this in perspective, this is almost 110 times the diameter of Earth, which basically means that about 1 million Earths could fit inside the sun. But you know what, that's kind of hard for me to personally imagine 1 million Earths. Like, what is that? It's a little hard to quantify. So, another perspective would be, if you were to fly a commercial plane, say like a Boeing 747, around the equator of of the Earth, and if you departed from an airport near the equator and just flew around the world with an average ground speed of 550 miles per hour, it would take about 45 total hours, plus any stops for refueling and possible weather conditions. So, to just travel in an airplane around our planet, at the equator, around the equator, so you're looking at at least a solid two days journey, give or take a few hours. 
Okay, so now let's look at the sun. If you were to fly around the sun in similar conditions, so now here's another quick disclaimer. We don't actually have the technology to do this yet, and with our current technology, you would die from radiation poisoning long before you could get to an average cruising altitude of 30,000 feet. But if in our imagination, we were able to fly around the sun with similar conditions as we would fly around the earth, instead of a two day journey, you're looking at least at a 12 to 13 year journey. Moral of the story, the sun is super big. And finally, thanks to Astro Bob, here's another quick analogy just to put the size of the sun and the earth into perspective. So if you were to reduce the size of the sun to an average size of a grapefruit, the earth would roughly be the size of a poppy seed, and it would be sitting about 10.7 meters or 35 feet away. That's kind of a little easier to put into perspective for me. Let me know what you think. Or listeners, if you have a better way of thinking about it, please share. I'd love to hear it. And so here are some other fun and quite useful facts about the sun. Fun fact number one, the atmosphere of the sun is composed of three layers, the photosphere, the chromosphere, and the corona. Fun fact number two, the energy created by the sun's core is from nuclear fusion. Fun fact number three, temperatures inside the sun can reach 15 million degrees Celsius. That's really hot. Fun fact number four, the sun has a powerful magnetic field. Fun fact number five, it takes eight minutes for light to reach Earth from the sun because the average distance from the sun to the Earth is about 150 million kilometers and light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second. So when you divide one by the other, it gives you 500 seconds, which is approximately eight minutes and 20 seconds. And side fun fact, this energy can reach us here on Earth in just mere minutes, but it can take millions of years for it to travel from the sun's core to the surface. And then finally, fun fact number six, the distance between Earth and the sun changes. Say what? This is because the Earth travels on an elliptical orbit path around the sun, and the distance ranges between 147 to 152 million kilometers, and scientists have just termed this as the distance between the sun and the earth as one astronomical unit. And we'll be discussing this more in future episodes. And there are other great websites and books out there that have even more fun facts about the sun, but these are definitely some of the more important facts when it comes to marine science, as you will see in this episode, as well as in future episodes. So now in our next episode, we'll be discussing temperatures of the ocean. So for now, let's talk about the sun as a black body. And no, a black body in this episode does not refer to any race or nationality or even pigment level. But if you've ever taken a physics class, you may have heard the sun referred to as a black body. And if you've never heard of this term before in school, don't worry, you don't have to go back to school for it because you're listening to this podcast. And this concept of the sun being a black body is pretty important to marine science and, well, all life on Earth for several reasons. But let's first ask, what is a black body? A black body is a theoretical concept, meaning it doesn't necessarily exist outside a quote-unquote perfect world. And the idea of a black body was originally introduced in 1860 by the German physicist Gustav Kirchhoff. And a more formal definition of a black body according to the Merriam-Webster online dictionary is, a black body, all one word, is an ideal body or surface that completely absorbs all radiant energy falling upon it with no reflection and that radiates all frequencies with a spectral energy distribution dependent on its absolute temperature. And it was named black body because it absorbs radiation in all frequencies, unlike a white body, which is one with a rough surface that reflects all incident radiation completely away. But a good way of visualizing a black body, especially since that definition was a little hard to follow, one way to think of a black body is to think of something that's black that's not shiny. Like, I have a really comfortable black hoodie that I like to wear, or at least we call them hoodies in Jersey, but if you're from a different part of the United States or another part of the world, you might call it a sweatshirt or a jumper or a jacket, but anyway, I have this really comfortable black hoodie And one day, I was wearing it in the morning, then I decided to take it off because it was a really beautiful day, and I left it in my car in direct sunlight. Then a couple hours later, I come back to my car, pick up the hoodie, only to discover that it's really hot, even hotter than my car seat that is a lighter shade of gray. What happened? Well, in the case of my hoodie, 
it was absorbing the energy from the sun, causing it to heat up. And because my hoodie is not shiny, it didn't have the opportunity to reflect some of that energy. And if you think about it, have you ever been told to wear dark colors during the winter and light colors during the summer? It follows a very similar principle. Okay, so now you may be wondering, how is the sun a black body if you're talking about absorbing heat from the sun? Great question, which actually is my next question. How is the sun a black body? So let's go back a little bit, or let's go back to that last little phrase in the definition of a black body. A black body is an ideal body or surface that completely absorbs all radiant energy falling upon it with no reflection, and here we go, pay attention, and that radiates all frequencies with a spectral energy distribution dependent on its absolute temperature. So let's focus a little bit on this idea of temperature. The temperature of an object, say the sun, is a direct measurement of the energy of motion of atoms and our molecules. The faster that the particles move, which can be rotational motion, vibrational motion, or even translational mo motion. But anyway, the higher the temperature of the object, the faster the particles move. So if you can imagine it, the sun is super hot because all those hydrogen and helium and those other atoms that make up the sun are bouncing around at super fast speeds. And I'll briefly mention it here that in science, there are three main temperature scales that we use, Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin, or Kelvin is what we refer to as absolute temperature. And the only real difference between the Celsius and the Kelvin scale is the zero point. The Celsius scale sets zero at the freezing point of water, whereas the Kelvin scale sets it at the point that all molecules stop moving. And so water freezes at 273 Kelvin, and water boils at 373, rather than zero and 100 degrees Celsius, respectively. And I say all of this now because all objects with a temperature above absolute zero, or zero Kelvin, gives off light. That's really cool. So that actually includes you and me as well, but more on that in just a minute. Okay, so going back to our definition of a black body, another way of saying it is, a black body is an object that absorbs all of the radiation that it receives, that is, it doesn't reflect any light, nor does it allow any light to pass through it and out the other side. And the energy that it absorbs heats it up. And then, as it's heated up, it will emit its own radiation. And the only parameter that determines how much light the black body gives off and at what wavelength is its temperature. And while there is currently no object that is a true, ideal black body, many objects such as stars and the sun behave approximately like black bodies. And a common everyday example of this might be like the burner element on an electric stove. As you increase the setting on the stove from low to high, you can observe it produce black body radiation. The element will go from nearly black or like that dark metally color to a glowing red hot. And just fun side fact, this is also portrayed in a lot of superhero movies that have recently come out in theaters lately, but they're not paying me so I'm not going to say which ones. So going back, the temperature of an object is a measurement of the amount of just random motion or the average speed of the particles that make up the object. And the faster that the particles move, the higher the temperature. And when charged particles, like those found in the sun, are accelerated, they create electromagnetic radiation, or light. And like I said earlier, any object with a temperature above absolute zero, or zero Kelvin, or negative 270 degrees Celsius, will contain moving charged particles, and so they'll emit light. And the hotter the object, the more light it will give off. And I'll say this quickly now, there are many different kinds of light based on the wavelength. And so you may be familiar with terms like UV radiation, visible light, infrared, radio wavelengths, gamma rays, and x-rays. Those are all different kinds of light with different wavelengths. And so a black body will give off light with all the different wavelengths. But the hotter the object, the shorter the majority of those wavelengths will be. So for instance, your own body has an average temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, or 98.6 Fahrenheit, or 310 Kelvin. And so the light that our bodies emit is in the long wavelength range of infrared. And unfortunately, our eyes don't see infrared light unless assisted. We'd have to be like Predator or in one of those super cool spy movies. And actually, a recent movie that I just saw over the weekend, which I won't name names here, had this technology that you could just put a sensor to a door and it read the infrared signal of the people behind the door. It was super cool. I really want one of those. But moving on, the sun has a temperature of approximately 5,800 Kelvin. 
and I've actually read sources that say that it could even be as hot as 6,000 Kelvin. But either way, at this temperature, the light that the sun emits is in the super small wavelengths of light. And actually, they're so small, we refer to the wavelengths as nanometers. And so the sun has a peak at approximately 500 nanometers, which actually is why the sun appears a bright whitish yellow color. And the majority of these wavelengths that the sun emits are also in the visible wavelength range, which boils down to this is the reason why we can see because the sun is super high and it's emitting these little tiny wavelengths that our eyes can actually use to see. Yay, sun! Okay, so my next question is, what about solar radiation from the sun? Well, just like we can measure the emission of light from the sun as wavelengths, if you remember what I said earlier, the sun is made up of charged particles that are moving at super fast speeds. And when these charged particles are accelerated, they create electromagnetic radiation. And we can measure that as wavelengths of light, or we can also measure it as solar radiation or solar energy from the sun. And the units that we use when we measure solar radiation is watts per square meter. And this is the same idea of the wattage that we use to refer to the different light bulbs that we use. And the average wattage that we see in light bulbs can be anything from like 40 to I think even up to 100 watts. And if you raise that light bulb to fill an area of a square meter or 1 meter by 1 meter square or 3.2 feet by 3.2 feet square, that would be the idea of like 60 watts per square meter or 100 watts per square meter. It's whatever the wattage or that amount of light that can fill that square. So just to give you a sneak peek, because I'm running out of time in this episode, the average solar radiation of the sun reaching the top surface of our atmosphere is 1,368 watts per square meter. That's a lot of energy, or a lot of light, however you want to measure it. But okay, I've actually ran out of time, so I'll end it here and pick it up in next week's episode as we start to discuss the ocean's temperature, which is very closely related to all that we've discussed in this episode. But before I say goodbye, I just want to say that knowing about the sun is super important to marine scientists because the properties of visible light and solar energy drive so many different physical properties of the ocean and impact many marine organisms and food webs and where creatures can live and so many other topics that it's just super important for the marine scientists to have a good understanding of the sun. And so finally, as I say goodbye, I'll leave you with this week's challenge to answer my question, listeners, why should you care? And how does this information impact your life? And don't forget to email me your answers at saltysciencepodcast at gmail.com. So until next week, remember to reduce, reuse, recycle, and refuse, and to always stay salty. Thank you for listening to Salty Science. But guess what? You don't have to let the fun end here. Go to www.saltysciencepodcast.weebly.com where I've posted some cool videos, my study notes, and some really neat experiments that you can try at home. And if you want to follow along with my own research, you can follow me on Instagram user handle Teps Adventure. That's T-E-P-S Adventure. All Salty Science episodes are available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcast, and YouTube, plus a number of other podcasting apps. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes as this is the best way to spread the word about this podcast. Salty Science is listener supported, so if you would like to show your support, visit our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash salty science, where you can either make a one-time donation of any amount or join the Salty Science crew for as little as a dollar a month. So visit the Salty Science Patreon and sign up today.